In World War II, the Royal Navy again spread wings, and our fleet carriers went into action for the first time. Behind their achievements was the calculated bravery of a thousand pilots with their air crews and floating airfields. There was a time when airships, blimps as they were called, were used as the eyes of the fleet. Then almost exactly half a century ago, a seaplane took off, crashed and was ignominiously recovered. Then another seaplane took off, flew and landed without mishap. So with this encouragement, four naval officers were chosen from 200 volunteers and taught to fly. From then on, flying machines, as they used to be called, developed steadily. The naval diehards frowned and scoffed, but the far-sighted imaginative few saw a new era dawning in sea war. How right they were. For no sooner had aircraft become established as the eyes of the fleet than they developed a sting as well. The branch that sprouted from the naval tree the day those four aviators got flying certificates from the Royal Aero Club was first of all part of the Royal Flying Corps. Then it became the Royal Naval Air Service. Then it was absorbed by the Royal Air Force. And finally, on the eve of World War II, it became the fleet air arm, under the full control of the Admiralty. Meanwhile, not only the seaplane, but every other type of flying machine, even those that looked as if they were driven by elastic, began to interest the Navy. But soon the float plane was voted too delicate. What the Navy wanted to extend the eyes of the fleet was something which could fly off warships at sea and help the big guns onto their target. Why not a makeshift airstrip on the guns themselves? It was tried and it worked. far so good. But what about recovering pilot and plane in mid-ocean? The first pilot to try and solve this one was squadron leader E.A. Dunning, who landed his biplane successfully on the deck of a ship as far back as August 1917. Dunning was not satisfied, and he tried again without the help of a handling party. Unfortunately, he burst a tar, fell over the side, and was killed. Nevertheless, his daring feat had taken root. Deck landing had started. Now the interest centered on landing aircraft on ships. From World War I, the aircraft carrier emerged. The battle cruiser Furious was decked. Later, her sister ships, the Courageous and Glorious, followed suit. The cruiser Vindictive was half converted. The Argus, laid down as a merchantman, had the first completely flush deck and took her place with the fleet at the first spithead review between the two wars. The Eagle was there too. She was the first warship designed and built as a carrier. About this time, there were other developments. The Queen Bee, a completely radio-controlled plane, was tried out. So were the first anti-aircraft guns afloat. Meanwhile, the tough amphibious walrus had developed from the seaplane. That was the stage the fleet air arm had reached when World War II broke out. The problem of floating aerodromes was still only half solved. With the impetus of war, research and investigation forged ahead. In a Scottish lock, a floating pontoon airstrip called Lily was tried out. A 
As soon as aircraft proved their value against U-boats, dual-purpose merchant ships called Mack ships appeared. Mack stood for Merchant Aircraft Carrier. The ships and cargo below and a few aircraft on the roof. From Mack ships to escort carriers. These were lightly built on a merchant ship hull with lift and hangar to house a squadron of torpedo bombers and fighters. These were the ships that were to play such a vital role in the Atlantic battle and on the Russian convoy run. Soon after the outbreak of World War II, the old but valuable Courageous and Glorious were sunk. The Ark Royal was the only first-line fleet carrier in the world. As the war progressed, the Navy's need for carriers increased. Our enemies extended their coastline and multiplied their airfields. We had to take our planes with us, refit them and keep them flying. Pilots, air crews, fitters and ship's crews were all in it together. And carriers often had their attendant escorts to look after as well. Although the modern carrier was not yet on the horizon, equipment and technique advanced in leaps and bounds. More and more planes were getting into the air quicker and quicker. The planes learned to unfold their wings and to fold them again. The batsman helped to land every single plane. Little did he know that one day he would be replaced by mirrors. Old catapults became new accelerators which meant that carriers no longer had to go careering off into the wind to fly off their planes. But one particular type of aircraft survived all these changes. It was the fairy swordfish. The string bag, as it was affectionately called. This 150 knot open cockpit two-seater biplane was obsolescent at birth, but never complete. Some people were astonished that such a museum piece should ever be in the front line. But it flew through desert sandstorms and it flew through Arctic blizzards. It carried torpedoes, bombs, rockets, radar, or motorbikes. Sometimes the aerodynamic experts were staggered at the performance of this winged Christmas tree. One flew with five Frenchmen as well as its crew. Another spent the equivalent of nine weeks in the air. The string bag took part in countless strikes and raids, two of which I will tell you about later. Bigger, faster, longer range planes came and went, but the string bag was the only aeroplane that saw both ends of World War II from the air. Then there were the men who flew. Not many to start with. The briefing they got was sometimes pretty brief. But gradually pilots and air crews came in from Canada, Australia and New Zealand to fill the gaps and swell the ranks. Fleet air arm operations were stepped steadily up and up. So was the flak that they had to fly through. place quite like the flight deck of a carrier. Those who work there are not all concerned with flying, but every landing, every takeoff, every fighter that goes screeching past the deck level is an event which concerns everyone. Especially the batsman who urges every pilot into position. But sometimes the matter is beyond the batsman's control. Sometimes the plane lands on its nose. Or crash lands after being damaged. As soon as the pilot is extracted and the fire extinguished, over it goes. There's no room for crops. Sometimes the barrier stretched across to protect waiting aircraft, 
stops the plane. No wonder carrier captains look a bit harassed now and then. Apart from flight deck flutters, other anxious moments where pilots can't even reach the carrier. There is only one fate for a plane in mid-ocean with a dry tank. But happily, the pilot is often picked up by an escort and returned in good shape. These setbacks don't compare with the pilots who land safe and happy and bring home stories about the one that got away. Compress all you have seen into one ship. A ship which was the last word in aircraft carriers at the outbreak of World War II. 27,000 tons, 800 feet by 100, built to carry 1,500 men and 72 aircraft. Here is the story of that ship, HMS Ark Royal. Launched in April 1937, taken over by the Navy 20 months later, Britain led the world with this ship, which embodied all that had been learned about flying since those pioneer days. She was the third Ark Royal in British naval history and certainly the most appropriately named. A steel box rising 60 feet from the sea with an overhanging roof. A factory, hangar, office block, hotel, all in one, which could move at 32 knots and was covered with a two-acre, well-defended airstrip. When war breaks out, the Ark is with the home fleet. From the outset, she becomes the number one target for German bombers and also for Lord Hawthorne, that German radio announcer who periodically says, Germany calling. Britain, ask your admiralty, where is the Ark Royal? The Ark Royal is busy. First she steams down into the South Atlantic searching miles and miles of ocean with the German pocket battleship Graf von Spee. The Ark is an ungainly sight at sea level, but pilots say that you have to be lost in the Atlantic without much petrol left to realize how beautiful she looks from above. Graf's pay is not sighted. The Germans invade Norway. The Ark leaves the tropics and heads for the Arctic. She rejoins the home fleet. Her planes strike at enemy shipping in Norwegian fjords. enemy territory. When Norway is evacuated, she covers the returning convoys. Then she sails south to form an important part of what is to become the famous Force H, a powerful squadron under Admiral Somerville, well placed to Gibraltar to face trouble either in the Mediterranean or the Atlantic. Her first sortie is to Iran. There she has the unenviable role of the big guns of her squadron pounding anchored French warships, rather than allow them to come under German control. Then, after covering convoys and supplies to Malta, the Ark sails for Dakar to take part in a second bid for the remains of the French fleet. After that, home, seven days well-earned leave. In the first year of war, this ship had steam up for 300 days and had travelled a distance of more than four times round the world. Back in the Mediterranean, with Italy now in the war, the Ark Royal is second only to Malta as an enemy objective. Bombs rain down on her. Although her fighters do their best, a great deal depends on her anti-aircraft guns and the men who man them. missed again and again, sometimes by a few feet. Once more, Lord Hawthorne starts asking, where is the Ark Royal? Then, 
Out goes Force H into the Atlantic after the German battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Neisnau, who have broken out and are causing havoc among Allied shipping. On this occasion, a plane sights the enemy momentarily in bad visibility, but too late to attack. The German ships escape into Brest. At 22 minutes past seven, on the evening of the 23rd of May, 1941, the British cruiser Suffolk makes this signal from way up in the Denmark Strait between Iceland and Greenland. One battleship, one cruiser in sight. The Admiralty orders Force H to Gibraltar to raise steam for full speed. The two ships the Suffolk has reported are the German battleship Bismarck and the cruiser Prince Eugen. Of Gibraltar, Admiral Somerville detaches his destroyer escort and presses on into the northerly gap. Was there ever such an improbable airstrip as the flight deck of the Ark Royal as she battered her way through the gale? Yet it was almost as bad for fleet carrier Victorious racing westward with the home fleet. Not only, however, did the Victorious manage to fly off a strike of swordfish, but they found their target. Unfortunately, this torpedo hit did not stop the Bismarck. She evades her shadowers and disappears. After a tense, desperate search, the Bismarck is spotted by a Catalina aircraft from Coastal Command. Ark Royal Swordfish but through a classic misunderstanding, their first torpedo strike is directed at the British cruiser Sheffield. The Sheffield manages to avoid these torpedoes, but signals exchanged afterwards between Sheffield and Ark Royal make the signal lamps overheat. Then the Ark Royal launches a second strike. It is now evening, the gale is still blowing. This time, one of the string bags torpedoes hits the Bismarck aft, smashing her rudder and sealing her fate. Next day, the home fleet finish her off. By the time the Ark returns to Gibraltar, everyone knows the part she has played and gives her a great welcome. Throughout 1941, the Ark helps to fight convoys and supplies through to Malta. Then, as she returns from a ferry trip with the old carrier Argus after flying 37 hurricanes off to Malta, she is struck by three torpedoes fired by U-81. At first, it looks as though she could be patched up enough to make Gibraltar. Water pours in, the list increases. Bit by bit, her machinery fades. At six o'clock on the morning of November the 14th, only 30 miles from Gibraltar, she rolls over onto her side and slides down on her last journey of a thousand fathoms. The most famous of all the British aircraft carriers, leaving behind her an imperishable memory. In a previous episode, I told you how an aircraft from the carrier Formidable stopped the Italian cruiser Polar which led to the British victory off Cape Matapan. Now I would like to pick out two other remarkable feet out on achievements, one in Norway and one in the Mediterranean. In the early spring of 1944, a large British carrier force approaches the Norwegian coast unseen. The objective? The German battleship Tirpitz lying in... 163 fleet air arm pilots and observers many of whom are from Canada, Australia and New Zealand, had been practicing this operation for weeks over a Scottish lock. Before dawn on this lovely calm April morning, two strikes, each of 21 Barracuda bombers and 40 fighters, take off, form up and head for the Norwegian mountains. converge on Alton Fjord, the Tirpitz is getting underway. She is sailing for her first sea trials after damage caused by British midget submarines the previous September. Without any warning, the British planes suddenly appear from all directions. Surprise is complete. Timing immaculate. Fourteen bomb hits cause complete confusion. 122 dead, 316 wounded, including the captain. All is over in one minute. Only one Barracuda is shot down. 
Back goes the Tirpitz onto the lame duck list. Now from the snow-capped mountains of North to one of Italy's main naval bases, Taranto, in November 1940. On board the carrier Illustrious, air crews are being carefully briefed. 21 swordfish are about to take off in two waves, half an hour apart. Most of these string bags are to be armed with torpedoes, but some will carry bombs and others flares. As Illustrious will be 200 miles from the target at the time of takeoff, the string bags have to carry long-range petrol tanks as well. At 8.30 p.m. on November the 12th, the Illustrious turns into the wind and away goes strike number one. You will see from this model of Taranto Harbour that it is divided into two halves. In Mar Piccolo, the inner harbour, cruisers and destroyers are berthed here and here. Dividing them from Mar Grandi is the dockyard town of Taranto. In the main harbour, there are six battleships, including the two latest 35,000-ton Littorio class. There are anti-torpedo nets here, barrage balloons moored to lighters here, more barrage balloons along here. There are flagships moored in the harbour and round the perimeter are strong AA batteries. The Italians have no radar, but there is a network of sound locators linked up with the batteries. The air defence of Taranto, Il Duce thinks, is strong enough for him to put all his naval eggs in one basket. Just before 11pm, strike number one is located to the westward. Flares start to float down, over here to the eastward while the torpedo bombers glide down to masthead level and approach the anchorage from here, with the Italian warships silhouetted against the flares and the moonlight. Ship and shore batteries open up. The whole harbour becomes an inferno, but these stately string bags press on through flak, scraping past balloon cables to score two torpedo hits on the Littorio, and another on the Conti di Cavour. At the same time, bomb carriers attack the ships in Mar Piccolo, it's all over in a few minutes, but scarcely had the sound of these engines died away than more flares appeared in strike number two. This time, the torpedo bombers come in over Cape Rondinella. The AA barrage breaks out with renewed vigor. Everything but the kitchen stove is thrown into the air. But like their predecessors, in come more swordfish at naught feet, wading and jinking through it all. Strike two, score a third torpedo hit on the Littorio and another fatal one on the Cayo Duilio. The bombers hit the seaplane sheds, the oil tanks, and more ships in Mar Piccolo. Number one strike leader was shot down into the harbor, but the pilot and observer were picked up and taken prisoner. One swordfish of the second strike was never seen again. One battleship sunk, two others knocked out for the rest of the war. The Italian Navy's battleship strength halved. Other ships and installation damaged, and all for the loss of two swordfish and one crew. This bid by 21 swordfish from HMS Illustrious impressed the whole world, including the Japanese. For there is little doubt that the attack launched 13 months later on the American fleet at Pearl Harbor was based on this fleet air arm visit to Toronto that moonlit night.